A devastating famine spreading beyond the land of Egypt, stretching as far as the region of Canaan. Joseph's father Jacob, also known as Israel, became aware that there was stored grain available for purchase in Egypt, electing to send ten of his sons on a mission to buy for their family much-needed supplies. However, in order to do so, they would have to appear before Egypt's governor, this Egyptian official in charge of the kingdom's storehouses, being none other than their lost brother, Joseph, whom they had sold into slavery some 20 years earlier. Joseph, now referred to by an Egyptian name, dressed in Egyptian garb, and speaking in an Egyptian tongue, was, however, unrecognizable before his clan. Joseph, on the other hand, though, immediately recognized his brother, and he quickly accused them of being Canaanite spies, offering that the only way they could prove their innocence was to return home and retrieve for him their younger brother, Benjamin, who had remained home with his father, Israel not allowing Benjamin to travel to Egypt for fear of his treasured son's safety. Joseph opted to seize the second oldest of his father's son, Simeon, and effectively held him hostage in an Egyptian prison until his brothers would return with to him with their younger brother. Yet once they were returned to Canaan, Joseph's father Jacob refused to let Benjamin go, accusing his gathered sons of being responsible for the loss of first Joseph and now Simeon, unwilling to lose for himself a third son. So with their pantry now fully stocked with grain, these ten brothers and their father Jacob remained in Canaan, which is where we're going to be picking up the story of Joseph today in Genesis chapter 43. With Jacob surrounded by his family while Simeon remained alone in an Egyptian prison. But before we open up the text of the Bible today, let's begin this weekend's study of God's word together with prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to gather with one another, even though we may not be in the build same building, even though we may not be in the same city. But Lord, wherever we are, we're able to open your word and through the, 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 the gift of the internet that we can study this together, the story of Joseph, but also the story of you and your redemption of humankind. So, Lord, as we open this word today, may you speak to our hearts. May you hear, we hear what you have to say so that we can accept it into our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ the sure and steady.
steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory, as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the As Joseph had earlier predicted, the famine that was to sweep the land was to last a full seven years. And the nine brothers, since Benjamin remained at home and Simeon was still shackled in prison, nine brothers had not been able to carry seven years worth of grain with them home to Canaan. So in time, the grain they had originally taken with them from Egypt eventually ran out. And Jacob left with no other option, resolved to instruct his sons to return back to Egypt to retrieve some more supplies. But before setting out for Egypt once again, Judah stepped forward and reminded his father what the stern Egyptian official they had dealt with earlier, the one who accused them of being spies, had warned them of. As we turn our attention today to Genesis 43, beginning in verse 3. But Judah said to him, that is his father, the man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And reminded of this predicament for a second time now, Joseph protested his son's return to Egypt with their younger brother Benjamin in tow. Their father even blamed the brothers themselves for their present predic predicament, since it was on account of their loose lips that this official even knew that they had another brother at home in the first place. And as we learned last weekend, when Israel's sons had first returned from Egypt and pleaded with Jacob to let them take Benjamin back to the governor to grant their brother Simeon his freedom, Jacob staunchly refused. Even after his oldest son, Reuben, offered that if anything happened to his treasured Benjamin, that Jacob could have the lives of his own two sons in exchange. Yet on this occasion, recognizing the severity of their situation, resolving that if nothing was done, their families could potentially starve, it was Reuben's brother, Judah, who now offered his very own life to Jacob, with a willingness to be eternally indebted to his father, should something happen to Benjamin. In verse 8, And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will rise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. Eventually, reason surpassed emotion. And Jacob finally relented, suggesting that the brothers not only take along enough silver to pay for this load of grain, but enough to also pay for the last load of grain that they had received freely, without making payment to the Egyptians the last time around. He also instructed them to bring along several of the region's treasured natural resources, honey, spices and nuts to present as gifts before this Egyptian official, all in a desperate attempt to further appeal to the governor's kindness and mercy. And then before his sons departed for Egypt, Jacob expressed aloud, May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, 
and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, well, I am bereaved. Jacob pled for God's mercy, seemingly portraying some semblance of an understanding of faith that everything was in the Lord's hands. But he was still apparently doubtful that things would end well in this situation. With Israel almost appearing to have resolved that he would never see his son Benjamin again, already preparing himself for the period of bereavement that was sure to follow. And the ten brothers set out for Egypt, and as they arrived, Joseph was pleased in counting their number to find that his younger brother Benjamin was now in attendance with them. So he instructed his house steward to prepare a meal for this traveling party from Canaan in his very own home. However, when the brothers were taken to Joseph's house, they swiftly became fearful of this unusual act of special treatment. So certain were they that a meal in the home of Pharaoh's second command wasn't common practice for foreigners purchasing grain. And they falsely concluded because of their apparent theft of the unpaid grain from the last trip, Joseph was seductively luring them into a trap to inevitably make them into his slaves. After all, it wasn't uncommon for Egyptian officials of great power and authority to employ a great number of slaves in their home, to such a degree that many of their residential estates even housed their own dungeons. And the brothers were certain that it wasn't to a dining room, but to the governor's basement dungeon that was where they were truly headed. So the brothers nervously approached Joseph's steward to confess to him that the last time they departed Egypt, they had unwittingly traveled home with all the silver they had brought to purchase their last load of grain still in their bags. To which the steward responded in verse 23, he replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. The steward didn't even offer that it was master, the Egyptian governor's kindness and mercy that returned their silver to him, but that was their God, the God of their father Israel, that had granted to them their earlier payment. And surely by this point, things were getting curiouser and curiouser. The steward brought the now reunited 11 brothers to Joseph's home, providing feed for their donkeys and giving them water to wash their feet. As the clan prepared to present Joseph with the gifts they had brought with them from Canaan. And when Joseph arrived home for lunch, the brothers humbly greeted him by bowing low to the ground presenting him with the gifts they had brought. And Joseph must have once again been reminded of the dreams he had as a teen when his family had bowed down to him. But alas, his parents were still missing from the picture. Joseph asked his brothers how they were faring, also inquiring about the well-being of their father. And while continuing to bow low in reverence before him, the brothers shared how their father, this Egyptian official's servant was still alive and well in his old age. And it was at this time that Joseph's attention was then drawn towards his younger brother Benjamin, his closest relation, the only other son born of the love of Jacob's life, Rachel. Deeply moved by his brother's appearance, however, who couldn't have been much more than a boy the last time he had laid his eyes on him, Joseph became emotionally overwhelmed and he hurriedly withdrew into a private room far from his brother's eyes to sob and weep. And only after he had regained his composure once more did Joseph return to begin the dinner. Local custom dictated that Egyptians could not dine at the same table with Hebrews. So Joseph sat at one table, his fellow Egyptians at another, and the brothers sat at a table all to themselves. Joseph categorically arranging for the brothers to be seated in ascending order of their ages. And realizing the seating order, 
The brothers all looked at one another in astonishment, sure that their seating arrangement was not some coincidence, yet still unsure of how this Egyptian official, this stranger, would have known their ages in order to seat them so. And once this meal was inevitably served to the individual tables from Joseph's own table, the master table, the Egyptian governor ensured that Benjamin's portion was a whole five times greater than anyone else in attendance. And the brothers comfortably feasted and drank freely with Joseph in his home. Now on a rare occasion within the text of Genesis, it would appear that this part of Joseph's story ends well. The brothers are reunited with one another, enjoying a resplendent feast, even though they might be seated at different tables, and the brothers don't yet know of the true identity of their mysterious benefactor. But a whole lot have to happen in order to arrive at this conclusion. Most notably starting with the person who didn't presently have a seat at this table with them. Their shared father, Jacob. Just over 70 years ago in 1952, no, I wasn't born yet, a Protestant preacher named Norman Peale wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, a book that has been published and republished numerous times over. The best-selling book focused upon how possessing a positive perspective can substantially improve one's life. And should we take such a position to heart, it's inevitable that the opposite should be considered true as well. That negative thinking has power too. Perhaps even one that is more tremendously powerful and potentially crippling if left unchecked. And it would seem to appear that such a negative power firmly held its grip on this family's patriarch, Jacob. Even before the day he seemingly lost his favorite son, Joseph, some 20 plus years earlier. Those who have been with us here at Trailhead these past several months may remember some of the accounts from Jacob's own life from earlier studies. That he almost feared the worst in, in every situation, ever electing to take matters into his own hands instead of faithfully trusting in the Lord. Such a lack of faith demonstrated as we witnessed him fearing harmful action from his uh, father-in-law and becoming nervous about retribution from his older brother for robbing him of his birthright, just to name a couple of instances. As time and time again, a prevalent attitude of negativity permeated much of Jacob's life. And now it would appear that it was a trait that he had inevitably passed on to his sons too, who even as they were being afforded some taste of royal luxury, they still feared the worst. Evangelical author and preacher Chuck Swindoll wisely offers three techniques, if you will, that we can each personally use to avoid developing a persistently negative nature and attitude within our own lives. First, he suggests that we recognize and admit our negative mentality. In regards to negativity, it can be said that much of the cure is in the confession. That is, a spirit of negativity along with sin can't be possibly removed until it is first recognized. After all, only after someone acknowledges the presence of negativity or sin in their lives can they ever hope to properly address it. Immediate correction begins with honest admission. Recognizing, realizing, and admitting one's own negative mentality is needed before we can move beyond it. Don't, don't hide it. Quit denying it. But just own up to it and proactively do something about one's negative nature. Number two, force a vertical focus until it begins to flow freely. A bad habit never lies down, surrenders, and dies on its own. And instead, we have to put forth a fairly substantial personal effort in order to break free from the pattern. If you go to bed each night with a negative attitude, 
chances are you're going to wake up the next morning with the very same horrible perspective. In fact, you might even be a little more negative as you continually stew in your own negative juices. So what can we do to combat such an attitude? Well, Swindoll suggests that we need to focus our attention not just on those barriers and walls in front of us, but adjust our focus upward, looking up vertically and not just out, intentionally bringing what's troubling us before God, acknowledging that he retains the power and ability to turn our attitudes around, most predominantly with the help and activity of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, number three, stay open to a new idea for at least five minutes. Baby steps are better than no steps at all. When something new, challenging, or unexpected confronts you, don't just answer with a negative attitude and an immediate no without giving a second thought. Putting a halt to a new opportunity before you even get started. But rather, instead, Swindoll suggests that we wait five minutes, all of 300 seconds, in an effort to hold off and withhold making a quick and hasty decision right away, one that you might regret later. This might not sound like much, but most times we say no because we already possess a negative attitude and perspective about a certain thing, person, or activity. This negativity largely based upon biased thought and speculation. But does our proclivity to saying no to a new experience prohibit us from personally growing and expanding? I mean, would you be able to join my family for dinner tonight? Um, no. Would you like to pursue a new hobby with me? Um, no, another no. You want to try this new salad I read about online on saw on TikTok? Uh, hard no. Can you help out with volunteering at church? Hmm. For much of our story so far, Joseph's father Jacob appeared to have been locked in with just such a negative, pessimistic attitude that permeated his life and existence. Over two decades has passed since he had first lost his favorite son, Joseph. And yet even now, years later, his loss apparently still weighed heavily on his heart and significantly factored into much of his decision-making. Even after first learning Simeon, one of his sons had been seized and held captive in Egypt pending the arrival of his brother Benjamin to substantiate their family's innocence, Jacob refused to let his youngest son go to win for Simeon his freedom. And much later, after the family consumed all the grain they had originally brought home from Egypt, and their ability to purchase some more relied upon Benjamin's accompaniment with the brothers to Egypt, Jacob again refused. Jacob even shared a belief that his sons were at least somehow responsible for the apparent demise of his favorite son Joseph, and he was seemingly reluctant to confidently trust in them any further. Jacob also blamed his sons for spilling the beans during their first trip to Egypt too. When they had firm, formed this Egyptian official about the very existence of their young brother Benjamin who remained home with Jacob and Canaan. But feeling left with no other alternative, Jacob finally relented. This permission almost equal with surrender. As by granting Benjamin permission to travel with his brothers to Egypt, their father pretty much appeared to have given up, already preparing himself for the further mourning and bereavement to come. It's hard to sensibly defend Jacob's protection of Benjamin, particularly when so many other lives hung in the balance. One could possibly argue that had Jacob possessed a confidence in the Lord to protect and watch over his family, he would not have hesitated for a moment in sending Benjamin to Egypt. But rather instead, Jacob's faith in this matter appeared to be lacking. And rather than focus upon the tremendous good God had already delivered into his life, Jacob, a lot like many of us, choose to instead focus our attention on the bad, looking out 
instead of looking up. And sadly, if one chooses to keep their eyes focused on the darkness, they'll never allow themselves to see the light. Last weekend, countless families across Canada celebrated Thanksgiving. Many celebrating the holiday with a huge turkey dinner and enjoying the extra day off on a long weekend. Without ever once seriously pausing to express any measure of true thankfulness or personal gratitude for what they personally have and experience in life. Such people are commonly focused on the present and not focusing upon the possibilities ahead. Their appreciation largely based upon an understanding that yesterday's struggles are thankfully in behind them in the past, while lacking any true sense of hope that tomorrow will be any better. Do you know anybody like that? Those who think that the glass is half full, the life is just one long series of hardship after hardship, and there's no real hope for the future. Likewise, negatively believing that the world is presently in a steady, ever-creasing decline into depravity, and that everyone else around them is to blame particularly those in positions of political leadership. For decades now, the church has been faced with an uphill battle when it comes to championing the rights of the unborn, with a greater number of people across North America choosing to make the selfish decision to terminate a pregnancy because carrying the unborn child through to birth might possibly inconvenience them. I mean, we might want to pl blame the government but in actuality, the government's only acting in an effort to please the majority and win re-election, buckling to the people's demands, even if their constituents' wishes are ethically and morally wrong. And more recently, those who believe in the sanctity of life also face a new battlefront, one in which medical assistance in dying is being offered as a proper method of treatment for a variety of ailments by legit registered Canadian physicians, resulting in an ever-increasing number of people, citizens, all across our nation, nation, our own neighbors, choosing death over life. So just with these two examples in mind, it's difficult to argue that we don't presently live in a world of darkness. This darkness, a product of humanity's rampant sin with a tremendous amount of people worldwide resolving that there is no possible escape from this present state of despair. And our best course of action is just to suck it up and accept it. Our global population's outward anger and a sense of negative resentment ever increasing. But may I assure you today that there is hope for our future. Hope for all of creation. And that hope is found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. But sadly, there are a lot of people worldwide who resist hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, rejecting any notion that any possible help can be found in the Lord because they choose instead to focus their attention and fix their hearts upon that growing darkness that surrounds them. They question how a loving God can send people to hell. They reject the very notion of sin, refusing to accept that a personal choice to pursue one's immediate satisfaction could ever possibly be wrong. Arrogantly believing that there's no way any of their own personal choices and decisions could be wrong either. Leading many to adopt the position that it's them against the world. And they, more than anyone else, knows better what they ought to do and believe. Again, sound like anyone you know? But that, like that negative attitude I talked about earlier, only after we recognize how our own pessimistic hopelessness negatively affects our lives can we ever hope to resolve the situation and willingly step out of the darkness and into the light. One can but wonder how much joy did Jacob potentially deprive himself of 
throughout these past many years by building up protective walls around himself in an attempt to protect his son Benjamin, intent upon defending his own fragile emotional well-being. And in reflection of today's passage of Scripture, might we then also ask of ourselves, do we thoughtlessly place a limit on the joy that God can bring our way in this present day too? Because we lack a confident trust in him. Because we lack any sense of hope for the rescue that can only be found in the Lord. Because we are more prone to say no than to take a risk by stepping out in faith. I sought the Lord And He answered me And delivered me From every fear Those who look on Him Are radiant They'll never be Give you everything, magnify.
please don't consider my message today to be an attempt to minimize or downplay any amount of hardship or personal suffering that you might presently be facing yourself at this present time. But I do want to draw attention to our personal reaction to such trials whenever they come our way, forcing us to ask of ourselves the question, is the darkness in the world around us drawing us nearer to God or causing us to become more and more distant from Him? Because the farther we distance ourselves from the light, the further and further we inevitably plunge into darkness, isolating ourselves from the very promising comfort and hope that can only be found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Surely due to the earlier loss of his son Joseph, Jacob became overly protective of his surviving son Benjamin. But at what cost? And there will assuredly come times in our own lives when we might seek to excessively insulate ourselves from harm to you, rather than trust in the sovereign providence and protection of our Lord. And sometimes, like Jacob too, we might be successful in our attempts to guard ourselves from danger in our own individual power and strength, and at other times, more often than night, we might marvelously fail. But when we work independent of God, we act to segregate ourselves from not just the blessings of God, but from the joy we can experience through the presence of the Lord, both in our triumphs and in our failures. Historically, whenever a child injures themselves, a loving mother might try to comfort them with a treat, attempting to take their mind off of their injury, allowing them to partake in something they immensely enjoy, a, a piece of chocolate cake or a, a bowl of ice cream. Mom can't turn back the hands of time and prevent the injury from occurring, but she can direct your mind to something more soothing. As the saying goes, everything is better with chocolate, except tuna. I recommend you avoid the pairing of tuna and chocolate under any circumstances. But if chocolate can cause a person's attitude to perform a 180, how much more? might the presence of the Lord act to pick a person back up from off of the ground. Everything might be better with chocolate, but chocolate gets eaten, and a few minutes later, forgotten. Meanwhile, the Lord's presence endures above and through all things, our Savior never leaving our side. And we will become more aware of His comforting presence if we but choose to keep our spirits focused on the one true light, even on those ever-increasing occasions when we might find ourselves caught in the midst of darkness. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture today. And Lord, while it might seem to end with a happy ending and the brothers seated around a table enjoying a meal together, Lord, it almost didn't happen because Jacob lacked a trust in you. Lord, time and time again we have observed Jacob not trusting in your promises of provision, not trusting in your promises of protection and attempting to take matters into his own hands. And Lord, in hindsight, when we see the whole picture, we see how foolishly he acted. Yet, Lord, we might as well label ourselves fools too, because there are often times, Lord, where we too, not that we forget, but that we choose not to depend upon you. So, Lord, let us, let us realign our vision. So we aren't just focused upon the negative things that surround us, Lord, but we might focus ourselves upon you. That doesn't mean that we can't change. That doesn't mean that you can't change hearts. But Lord, may we not get bogged down by the negativity and the darkness of this world. May we choose instead to focus on you, to focus on the light and embrace the presence of your spirit in any and all situations. So Lord, as we close our time here together today, may we be mindful that when we speak a negative word or when we act negatively, Lord, our hearts can become more bitter and we can become more closed off 
not just from those around us, but from you as well. And let's avoid that at all costs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we've concluded our review of this portion of the book of Genesis. Observing the brothers contentedly dining together, and though they had cleared their name of any accusation of the family being Canaanite spies, Joseph would now move to orchestrate a plan that would lead to his brother Benjamin becoming seized, fulfilling his father's greatest fear by forcing Israel's favored son to remain with him in Egypt. But why, and for what reason, join us back here either online or in our Sunday morning worship service next week to find out. Until then, may God bless you all. May you know and experience his presence so that you could punch through the darkness and reach for the light. God bless and bye for now.